Express. Okay. Well, good evening. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath hours that are coming so quickly for this past week, for the blessings we have had in our studies, in our personal lives, and for the trials that um, you have been there to sustain us through. We pray, Lord, for one another. We know that um, Satan knows that he has but a short time. And he's seeking everything he can uh, to do to divide and discourage us. We pray, Lord, that we can press close to you, receive um, your comfort, and that we, with, in fellowshipping with you, we can truly experience fellowship with one another. Help us in the study here this evening. Guide and direct us. Open our hearts and our minds to your truth, and may your Holy Spirit correct any errors we may hold. And forgive us, Lord, for the way that we sometimes um, imagine um, wrong in others, but are unwilling to see the wrong in ourselves. Be with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, good evening. And Stephen? You're, it's pretty late. You're having trouble sleeping? Yeah, I fell asleep earlier and um, just woke up on the couch. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome. And uh, so our study here, uh, I'm, I'm getting to the point where we're going to be uh, closing up this study, no, probably not tonight, but um, maybe in the next couple of weeks. We're going to close up this study on um, the seven heads of Revelation 17. And, and what I wanted to do, because we had done quite a bit of work last week um, in looking at these various lines, but I want to take a much more um, serious look at how Collins study, the correct things about it, and how how we should understand it, or how we can understand it, how we can accept it, even though there are some things, some questions in his interpretation that we may have difficulty with. Now, um, tomorrow, we're going to have a study uh, on um, 2030, the Great Reset. Now, um, and just to kind of show you uh, some of the research I'm doing, I got this book here, so I don't know. You look at the here, COVID-19, The Great Reset by Klaus Schwab. Uh, my friend Ryan lent these to me. And then Glenn Beck's book on The Great Reset, plus a lot of things on the Internet. And, and so at some point, uh, those, those studies, which are going to be on Sabbath afternoons every second week, they'll also probably occur on Friday uh, evenings. Though I do want to look at some of the things regarding uh, Daniel chapter 11. So at some point, we're going to have to have a regular study on Daniel chapter 11. I'm not sure when we're going to do that, where we're going to fit it in to our studies. The, the morning studies on understanding the lines have been extremely profitable, but very slow paced. That is, um, we keep finding things that we, we're not expecting to find. And it's almost like uh, the further we go, uh, the deep, deeper we're digging. So it, it gets a lot slower as, as we progress. Um, so like Thursday, we spent most of the study on one verse. Um, so, so in these studies here, um, we're obviously going to pick up some of these things in later studies, that all of these studies are connected together. Now, I made a statement uh, originally, so I'm going to go back on December 25th, 2021. Colin did his first presentation. Um, on, it was entitled Dividing the Gold. And, and that was the weekend I had done all these presentations on Friday. We did some international presentations. Um, 
on Sabbath morning, we had done a study in Spanish and I was exhausted and, and I'd slept through uh, most of his study. Um, but when I, because I had to have a nap. And so when I came to, to his study, he had already really presented a lot of these things that of his view, but I could see right away. And I remember when I came into the study, I think it was, um, Bud had some some uh, some talking a bit, and I think Daniel Fontenot and and William they were um, trying to understand what he was saying. So I, I didn't I didn't get all of his initial parts of his arguments, but I could see right away that there was something to it. And so just to kind of quickly review, the view that this movement has held is that Revelation 17 is the seven heads are referring to the seven kingdoms, beginning with Babylon. Babylon, Greece, Rome, pagan, and then papal. And that we go to 1798 to get the time frame when it says five are fallen and one is. So the one is would be the United States. And then there's, of course, going to be the one that's going to come. One's yet going to come. And then... When that other one comes, we're going to see that there's going to be an eighth as well. And um, so let's take a look at, let's read through Revelation 17 and try to get in our minds how we, this movement has understood this. So there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the, in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So whether you're the pioneers or whether you're this movement, we would see that this period, that this wilderness is the 1260 years. And that this woman is sitting upon this scarlet, scarlet colored beast and that there's a differentiation between this beast and the beast of Revelation 13, as well as as the the beast, the great red dragon of Revelation 12. So we know this isn't the great red dragon of Revelation 12, and we know on the charts that this beast here is um, papal Rome. That's the way it's described on the chart where the beast that um, of Revelation 12 is uh, papal Rome, or pagan Rome, pardon me. And um, so you have pagan Rome, the great red dragon, with the seven heads and the ten horns and the ten crowns, or the seven crowns upon the seven heads. And in Revelation 13, you see papal Rome, again, but with uh, the crowns upon the horns, and then you see again papal Rome is the way it's described on the chart. Um, so they're going to say that this pa is papal Rome, but it's not the beast that's papal Rome. It's the woman that's papal Rome. Would we agree with that? Yes. Okay. So, so we have this woman riding this beast. And so we can say that this is you know, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, right? Um, so, so it has seven heads and ten horns. Well, we know there's no crowns upon the heads or the horns. In verse 4 it says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now, uh, what is this description of the woman? Why is she described in this way? lays out all the elements of the Catholic Church, the bishops and the cardinals, the tiara. Okay. And, and this is a counterfeit of something. What is it a counterfeit of? Why, why is this, uh, these colors and these precious things? It's a counterfeit of the sanctuary. So, so there's a counterfeit here of the sanctuary. That is, we know that the Catholic Church has 
counterfeited God's worship. And, and so these symbols here would be symbols that we could see connected to the sanctuary, though there's a perversion of them. It's not identical. Um, and then she has this golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So what is that golden cup? The one they use at Mass? Okay, so if we took it sort of literally, we, we could say that this is representing that the, the cup at Mass. So it has to do with worship. But it's full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So what, what is it filled with? Strange doctrine. Okay, so wouldn't this have to do with doctrine? That is, this, this is a cup filled with fermented wine, mm -hmm. corrupted truths. That is, it's, it's truth mixed with error. And, and so the error there caused this is to be abominable and filthy. So, so we know that these are the teachings of the Catholic Church, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and in verse 5 it says, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now we're going to see in the next part that this woman is drunken with the blood of the saints. So Iran made notice to this. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So, so why is this cup with these abominations connected with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus and, and we're gonna come back to verse 5 but um, so what is the connection there because so many have died and will yet die for the true faith as opposed to what Rome is spewing yeah so Rome is a persecuting power and it's persecuting those that don't accept its doctrines And so it's drunken with the blood of the saints. That is, that's part of its doctrine. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, if we go back to this title here, I saw upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. So, so why does she have this title on her forehead? The Catholic Church. Okay, yeah. So, so we know that this is mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, abominations of the earth, and we could break that down. But why is it written on her forehead? Well, as she thinks and chooses, so she does. Okay. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, is this how she thinks of herself? Well, as an ex-Catholic going to Jesuit-run masses and Jesuit-run schools, that's what I heard constantly. I mean, I was supposed to be damned to eternal hell fire if I dared set foot in the Protestant church. It was a mortal sin to miss mass. Yeah, but they wouldn't consider themselves the mother of harlots. They would consider themselves the true church. Yeah, holy mother church. Right. Yeah, well, the mother church, right, but not the mother of harlots. At, at least I don't think that that's the way that they would consider themselves. Now, um, when we have the fall of Babylon, um, um, it says um, in Revelation 8, verse 18, verse 6, reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her, her works. Um, in the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. Right? So this cup has to do with 
persecutions as well. How much she hath glorified, glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. So in her mind, she wants to believe that she's a queen and that she's not a widow. But we can see here that she's just a harlot. So she imagines herself as greater than she is. So when something's written on the forehead, what is that telling you? When we look at the mark of the beast, it's on the right hand of the forehead, or the seal of God is on the forehead. So what does it mean when it's on her forehead? Is this God's judgment being stamped on her forehead? God revealing her character. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So this idea of a mark on the forehead is God placing a mark upon her. He's showing who she is. Mm -hmm. Even though she may hide from that and imagine herself something else, this is what she is. So this is God's judgment. <clears throat> now we know that that John marvels or at this and and he wonders with great admiration. So why does he do this? What is John doing? Because remember he's a prophet and he sees something in vision. So what is why is he seeing it this way? So I mean, why, is, why, why is he seeing this in an allegory? Yeah. So, so he, why is he, why is he wondering? Because he's he's a prophet, and his wondering is prophetic. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, why is he wondering? What is he illustrating by wondering with great admiration? As in, how could this kind of thing be? Okay, but he's illustrating something. He's illustrating history. When he's wondering, he's acting. Because remember, when a prophet experiences something, it, when he asks a question, for instance, it doesn't mean that the prophet doesn't understand. He's, he's serving a prophetic role. Right? So the prophet becomes part of the vision. And he's wondering with great admiration. And this is... Um, it's it's a Hebrew idiom here. Um, so this expression is because the word admiration is wonder, right? So it's it's kind of a double, doubling. And when you double in Hebrew, that's the way that you do your um, um, uh, I can't think of the word. When you make something great, so like in dying ye shall die, ye shall surely die. Okay, what's okay but is this is this originally written in the Hebrew or in the Greek? It's written in Greek, but the book of Revelation was written by John, just like the book of John was and his letters. But he's writing it without um, a scribe. And, and we right. can tell that because it's written in very bad Greek. Okay. That is, he's his grammar is is poor, and it's also Hebrew grammar. So he's using Hebrew idioms or Hebrew grammar all throughout the Book of Revelation. So it's one of the problems in translating the Book of Revelation is that it's it's written in such poor Greek, and why some people try to say John didn't write it, but the explanation is is that he did write it, at, but he has no one to. To write it for him so he knows greek but it's not his first tongue so when he wrote the book of john he had a scribe help him 
right, to get it into proper Greek. And, and same when he wrote his letters. So, so it, it is a Hebrew idiom. We, we see this all throughout the book of Revelation. So he's, but, but the question is why, what is he illustrating? What is this wondering or this great admiration that he has? Why would he wonder with, with great admiration? Would he typifying those who wander after the beast? Okay, right. So he's typifying a class of people. Now, the time period in which he is, so we know that John is part of this vision, and he's going to be seen in the future, right? Now, the pioneers argue that even though he's seen in the future, when he has a conversation with the angel, he's talking from his time that is the angel is and him are in uh you know 96 a.d or wherever at the end of the first century a.d um but he's seen things in the future uh, so when does this wondering happen is this something that happens during the 1260 years or is it something that happens at the end of the world Well, Revelation 13 is at the end of the world. Yeah, so we're going to see it's at the end of this world that this wondering happens. So he's taken off way into the future. That is, he's not in 1798 seeing this beast and wondering at that time. He's seen this beast in the future. Because this is still future. This is not in his time. We can agree upon that, right? So, so in Revelation 13, uh, here, get rid of all these numbers. And the world wandered after the beast, 13 verse 3. And um, if we look at this here, you're going to see that same word, wondered. Right, so uh, 2295 and 2296 are the words in chapter 17. So, so he's tying you to this vision. Now, when he wonders, now remember, Revelation 13 is a different beast that he sees. So we know that this wandering after the beast happens after the deadly wound is healed, correct? Agreed. Right? I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. So that wasn't happening in 1798. The world wasn't wandering after the beast. It's not going to be until the future. So this is something that still has not happened. Now, I, I was um, sitting in the car for a little bit and turned on the radio and listened to a bit of news. And, and I found out that uh, uh, the Pope's going to be coming to Edmonton, which just seems kind of odd. I mean, Pope John Paul II was here back in, must have been 1983 uh, or 84, something like that. Um, so uh, I don't know if anybody, I, I never keep track of what the Pope's doing, but it, he's coming to Canada and he's going to come to Edmonton. So it's kind of interesting. Now, back in, in the 80s with John Paul II, I mean, he was the first popular pope, really, that, you know, the media got a hold of. And uh, and people make a lot about Pope Francis. I mean, he's popular with a different group of people, but they're both fairly popular popes. Um, now, can we say that the world is wandering after the beast at the present time? Yes. Okay. What would be your argument for that? That they're wondering after the beast? Yeah. Oh, well, you have St. Peter's Square that's completely chock full 
you have climate change, you have uh, the, the gay issue. There's just tons of stuff that the church is getting behind and the world is getting behind the ecumenical movement. Yeah, so we can see that the Pope is popular um, and that the Catholic Church has much more popularity than it's ever had with a larger group of people. But when it talks about this wandering after the beast, the whole world wandered after the beast, is there something else behind this that that hasn't yet happened so that we can say that the whole world has wandered after the beast? When Satan appears is... Okay. So, so the question is, what is this wondering specifically referring to? Okay, Iran says the Sunday law. Anybody else agree with that? I would go with that. Yeah, so I think... So we can see that there's definitely this happening, but when he wonders with great admiration, he's representing the world who's accepting the Sunday law. Can we say that? Or is it that he is presenting the Mother Earth Gaia and green and all this uh, in a way to deceive them and bring them to accept his Sunday as, as well. Okay, so so yeah, so there's going to be all these other things. Um, and and we're, we're going to deal with that, um, especially when we deal with the Great Reset 2030. We're going to look at these different powers that are vying for the control of the earth, but also in how they're interconnected. So, I mean, we know the United States, uh, the Soviet Union, and the papacy at the time of the end in 1989 are the three powers, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. But how they end up interacting and how they end up working together, even though they're working for their own aims, uh, that's one of the things we need to really understand in relationship to the Sunday law. It's one of the things... I've personally struggled with ever since I've been a Seventh-day Adventist, and probably many of you have, is how does the Sunday law come about? How do you have this entire world wander after the beast when you have lots of the world that is not, definitely not Catholic? You have Protestants, you have Muslims, you have atheists, you have spiritualists, you have all these different groups, and yet at some point, the papacy becomes the power that pulls all of this together. And the papacy is set upon the throne of the earth. And this relates to the Sunday law. Now, of course, when we talk about the Sunday law, we know it is progressive. That we have the Sunday law in the United States, and then that's going to lead to the Sunday laws around the world. But we don't really know how that happens, what the mechanism is what the issues are. They seem to be unfolding around us at the present time. Now, so in our interpretation or understanding of this, this Revelation 17, we have a solid footing for placing this as relating to the Sunday law. And when it comes to the heads themselves, I don't think we should question um, or, or dismiss this view that this movement has held, and we're going to see this as we go into the rest of this, that this woman is riding this beast, and this beast is the kingdoms of this world. Now, we know there's a difference between the base beast in Revelation 13, because in Revelation 13, it is a composite beast, and there's no woman riding it yet it still is papal Rome. And, and these are one of the, the, the problems that we have in trying to understand this connection. And we know that there's a two-horned beast that rises, 
and it's the one that's going to initiate this Sunday law. It's going to create the image to the beast. But now in Revelation 17, we see another beast, very similar, but obviously not the same beast. It's not a composite beast. And But we've taken the heads, and we've, we've made those heads to be, in a sense, representational of the kingdoms of the earth, starting with Babylon. And, and so we can see it in the composite beast that they're there in Revelation 13. But in Revelation 17, we take it as implied that these heads represent these same kingdoms that are in the composite beast. But we see the woman riding the beast, committing fornication with it. So, so this becomes a, a problem when we try to identify the beast itself in Revelation 17 as the papacy. And, and I don't think that that's implied. That is, the beast that she's riding is not the papacy. The beast that she is the papacy riding a beast. But they are connected. That is, she now has control of the kingdoms of the world at the end of time. She now is the one that's going to be in charge. She's going to dominate out of all these different powers that are vying for the control of the world, the woman is the one that wins, right? Because even the United States, it's going to make an image to the beast. It's going to worship the beast and its image and cause all the world to worship the beast and its image. Okay, so we know that the angel says, wherefore didst thou marvel? Now, we can also look at here this word marvel. Um, you know, it's just going to be um, that same word. So which, why did you admire? Right? So it's not a different word. They just translated it as marvel. But then he says, I will tell thee the mystery. Now, in this wondering or this marveling, is there also a type of questioning? That is, the angel's response here, does this show that even while he's admiring it, he's questioning it, and that the angel is now going to explain a mystery that he doesn't understand yet? Would we say that's implied here, or am I reading into it? I would almost think it's implied. Okay. Yeah. So, so his wondering, and we can think of the word of wondering, right? I mean, it's wondered with great admiration, but the, the word wonder and admiration, we wouldn't really think of them as, as the same. We think, well, I was wondering about something. We wouldn't necessarily think we're admiring it. But he's wondering with great wonder, you could have translated, or admiring with great admiration. Why did you marvel, or why did you wonder, or why did you admire? So, so those words don't really seem the same to us. But here in the Greek, uh, this idea of wondering implies a type of, well, even the word marvel. If you marvel at something, you say, this is just incredible. It's hard to believe, right? How is this so, right? And I think that's part of what's happening as well. So the world wonders after the beast. They're going to see the Catholic Church rise to this power. And in a sense, they're going to marvel. But they're not going to be interested in how this happened. They're just going to accept it. But here, John, as a prophet, he marvels as an illustration. But he's now going to have an answer given to him. I will tell thee the mystery of the woman. Now, this word mystery, it's, it's where we get the word mystery from. It's the secret, right? It, it's something that's hidden or secret. Um, and, and through the idea of silence imposed by initiation into religious rites. So it's usually a religious mystery or secret. So we know that at, at the time uh, after Christ, 
that you're going to have rising in the Roman Empire, uh, the mystery cults. And, and these are just basically secret rites um, that are mixtures of all different kinds of religions. They go to Egyptian mysteries and Babylonian things. A lot of them are made up. They're not really based on any kind of reality. Uh, it's just was very, very popular to be involved in these sort of mystery cults. You know, you would look at something like the Masons as a mystery cult. It's where everything's secretive, like a secret society. And these were really popular in Rome. And so we have here, he's going to tell him the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and the ten horns. So if he's explaining the mystery, what is he explaining? And, we, and Angela mentions Palmoni is also means a revealer of secrets, doesn't it? Yes. So there is a connection there. But when he's telling John, when the angel is telling John the mystery, what is it he's telling John, the mystery of the woman? What is it he's trying to convey or communicate? If she's a mystery cult, and he's going to explain the mystery, what is the angel doing? Identifying it or helping, helping them to know how it came about or who it is. Isn't he also providing a revelation? Yeah. And is he not exposing the secrets of the woman? Yes. Okay. So, so we, one of the things we know that's being explained here in Revelation 17 is the secrets of this mystery cult. Now, the idea is when you explain the mystery of a, of a secret society or cult, uh, why would that be bad for the cult? You no longer have control over your mind and your situation. Okay. So so in some ways, they believe that these mysteries um, are, are part of their power. And if they're being exposed and uncovered, then they lose their power. And is that true for us? When we understand the mystery of the woman, does its power over us disappear? Man. Yeah. So here, when he wonders with great admiration, as an illustration, he's like the world. And the world is going to wonder. But unless they have the mystery explained, they're not going they're going to have the the papacy will have the power over them. Now, and we can see then in order to be free from the power of the papacy, from the power of this mystery cult, it just takes a revelation of God. Does Satan have any true power over us? Not unless we give it to him. It's the power of deception. Right? That's the only thing he has. And right now, Satan is deceiving almost everyone. Even people who don't believe that they're deceived, that is, they believe that they understand the mystery, but they're being deceived in the very understanding that they have, because where do they get their information? The world or the media? Yeah. So if you get your information from CNN, are you being deceived? No, you couldn't. CNN, the Communist News Network, come on. <laughs> okay, what about Fox? If you get your news from Fox, are you being deceived? You mean, you mean the false prophet should be listened to? Right. Exactly. Yeah, so we can see whether it's going to be the Fox or CNN or that network i can never remember the name that jeff talked about on september 7th 2019 eternal world television network right so this catholic uh news outlet or wherever you get information it, it is only 
It's only information that comes from Satan. Satan has power over us because we believe a lie and we can think we're standing for truth. So Satan has a deception for every one of us, but God has the truth and he's going to expose this mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which has seven heads and ten horns. So the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Now, what does this remind us of? The beast that was. Oh, it, reminds me of, it reminds me of Islam in Revelation 9. Okay, so oh, it's a satanic power about. that comes out of the bottomless pit, right? Islam arises from the bottomless pit. So does this beast, okay? Now, what about the was and is not and ascendeth out of the bottomless pit? So this is the Antichrist, and it's uh, following the pattern of Christ. Okay, so it's in that direction. Right, so it's following the pattern of Christ. Now, it was, is not, and yet is. Um, and we get that in Revelation chapter 1. Um, um Verse 8, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. And this is an interesting verse, too. Um, I always use this with Jehovah's Witnesses, not that it ever has convinced any of them. But uh, this whole section here, this is a reference to the Old Testament, Jehovah. Now, they don't translate Lord here as Jehovah which they probably should because they say Jesus is the mighty God and, you know, the Father is the almighty God. But but this is actually a reference to Christ. And, and it's pretty clear that this is a reference to Christ, not the Father. Right? So anyway, that's kind of an aside. But you can see which is, which was, and which is to come. So you can see the parallel there with the Antichrist that the beast that was and is not and yet is. It has its own sort of temporal existence uh, that is a counterfeit of Christ. Now, we also have, um, where is this? Um, I have to click on this. Um, let me see here. So we have this in Revelation 13, verse 1 to 4. Um, where we see this deadly wound being healed. So we can we can relate to that, that to the resurrection of Christ. And um, it talks about that in Revelation 13. And there's another another verse that I can't think of offhand. But anyway. So we can see that this power is a counterfeit. So it was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. And they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Now, when we, we use this, we use this to place Revelation 17. So how is it that this movement takes this there's a beast that was is not and shall ascend of the bottomless pit it was and is not and yet is so where are we at the time that it is not from 1798 so we're in 1798 because it's the time when it is not so it, it has to be from 1798 into the time when, of course, it will ascend out of the bottomless pit. So it's in the is not time. And, of course, it's going to talk about that. Now, it's talking about the beast here. Now, what beast is it referencing? Is it referencing the beast that's here that this woman is riding? Or is it referencing the beast of Revelation 13? 
when it talks about was and is not, and yet is. The second one. Okay, second one is? The one that is not yet is. Okay, so so is that the Beast of Revelation 13 or the Beast of Revelation 17 that it's talking about when it talks about the beast? I'm still looking at this as being the Beast of Revelation 17, separate okay. from 13. Okay, so you're saying the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. Now, so so this is an important question because when we go here, we see that the woman is the papacy and she's riding this beast. Right? That we can't say that we can't say that the beast is the papacy. And and we know it's different from the beast of Revelation 13. It's it, it it's similar but different, just like Revelation 12 is a different beast. It's pagan Rome. So, but but this we can connect with the papacy, but it's the woman herself who's committing fornication with this beast that is the papacy. But then it's going to refer to this beast. Right? The beast that thou sawest was and is not. So it's not going to be talking about the woman here, right? It's going to be talking about the beast itself. So this this is something I don't fully have an answer to, but it's a it's a problem that we have to look into. Um, I mean, we can say the woman and the beast are one, so to speak, if we if we wanted to try to go in that direction. But it's not talking about the woman here. It's talking about the beast itself. Now some. Um, of the pioneers would look at this beast when it talks about the beast and they would they would re reference revelation 13 that is they would look at the beast of revelation 13 as the one that he saw that is not because it was and it is not and it shall ascend out of the bottomless pit because we're at the is not time and so in the is not time, this can't be referring to this beast in the sense that this beast is not. But the woman is going to ride the beast, and this is going to be in the future. So that this is the resurrection of this beast, so to speak, because it received a deadly wound in 1798. But at that time, it was this composite beast that was the papacy. And then this other beast arises, the two horned beast, that's going to be the United States. That's the is not time. And, and it wouldn't be referring to that beast because it is actually that beast is the beast during that time. So the is not period is in between Revelation 13 beast and the Revelation 17 beast. But the Revelation 17 beast is going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. It's still future. So it was, it was that Revelation 13 beast, but it's not anymore. But when it ascends out of the bottomless pit, it's going to be this beast of Revelation 17. That is, it's going to be resurrected. Now, they're going to use the heads, of course, to illustrate that, because one of the heads receives the deadly wound. But why is it that when one of the heads receives the deadly wound, the beast can be said as not? So Angela says the beast could be nations who were ridden by her when the papacy was supreme in the 1260. The New World Order beast is the entire world governed, becoming one under her control in the last days. Well, so I understand what you're saying. So what you're saying is that, well, the woman rode the beast in the past. But in Revelation 13, isn't that the beast of the 1260? The 
the composite beast with the ten horns with crowns. Yes. It should, it should be, yes. Okay. So so it's illustrating the 1260. This beast can't be illustrating the 1260. It has to be symbolizing the one that's going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. But during that time when it is not, because it receives this deadly wound, we know one of the heads received the deadly wound. The way that we would look at it is that that deadly wound was the fifth head. And then the sixth head is the United States. But it's going to be represented by the two horned beast. So it's a Republican head. And then there's going to be a seventh head. And that seventh head is going to be what? In our understanding of things. United Nations. United Nations. So we have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The dragon power is going to be the United Nations. The false prophet is the United States. And the beast is described as the papacy, right? Yet we have these beasts. And so when it says the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, this must be referring to back to Revelation 13. It can't just be talking about Revelation 17. That is, there's a connection between them. But now they're going to be separated. The woman is going to be separated out from the, the beast itself. And it's going to be riding this beast. So now they're going to, to give this, this thing, the mind that has wisdom. Now we know... When we go to Revelation 13, we have the other wisdom. Revelation 13, 18. Here is wisdom that him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. So we know in Revelation 13, we have this wisdom that's needed, and we have the same call to wisdom here. And here is the mind that hath wisdom. Now, Colin calls this a riddle, right? So there's a riddle here, and I guess we could call it a riddle. Um, but it's not like a worldly riddle. It's not some puzzle that um, that is meant to confuse us. It's meant to give us information. God is giving John information, but he's giving it in symbolic language. And it's meant to be understood, but it becomes understood as we go through fulfillments of prophecy. So this movement has taken this, and, and, and I don't think incorrectly, but there are things that we have to notice about it. So if we take Collins' interpretation, there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. Where are we placing our interpretation or application of the seven kings, five are fallen? Are we going to, what is it that Colin does in his understanding of this? So I'm going to go back to what we looked at last week. So we have all these uh, lines of kings. So if I'm going to say that there are seven kings, five are fallen and one is, who are the five that are fallen? according to Colin. It's going to be this line here. So who are the five that are fallen? Bush the first, Clinton, Bush the second, Obama, and Trump. Okay. So, yeah. And so he's going to, I guess we should look at it up here. Um, Now, isn't he going to start with Reagan? The one is his Trump? No, he was, what he was doing is he was eliminating Reagan. He was treating him strictly as a placeholder. Are you sure? There's no other way for this to have occurred and have Trump 
be one that was fallen or want Trump to be one that was it that is? Well, he'd have to because he's going to have Trump be the eighth. So I'm pretty sure that that's how he did it. But, OK, but I'm, I'm looking. You, you were saying the five that were fallen. So he's going to say that the five that are fallen are Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush the second, Obama. The one that is, is Trump. And then the seventh, he continues a short space. And then the eighth is going to follow. That's my understanding of how Colin did it. I can show you the diagram. OK, um, then I stand corrected. Yeah. So, so, and we talked about this as far as it doesn't make logical sense. Oh, I thought um, I thought he put I thought he put um, I'm happy Sabbath to everybody, but I thought he put Ronald Reagan and Bush as um, the first. Okay, I'll just both of them were both both of them were um, both number one because they both came in together or something though like that. Okay, just hang on. I'll find his diagram. I could be wrong too. They were still one and two. I think they were still one and two. I mean, that's what I think, but here, just hang on. I got to find the, the diagram. Um, okay, so. Um, yeah, I got his diagram here. <clears throat> so here's the diagram. You can see he's got Ronald Reagan as one, George Bush a second. So he's going to have five are fallen. One is is going to be Donald Trump. Seventh is Joe Biden. And then the eighth is Donald Trump again. That's the way that he did it. Now, we, we argued that that didn't, line up with the the kings in the book of daniel chapter 11 in that ronald reagan should be zero in the count because you're going to deal with um they're paralleling the kings of persia right so the kings of persia the first king of persia is cyrus not darius the mede so ronald reagan lines up with darius the mede cyrus is the first king of persia and of course, we can see when we take uh, uh, Revelation 11, where it talks about there shall yet three kings stand up in Persia, we can see we lined up Bill Clinton, George Bush uh, II, and Barack Obama with those. And then the fourth shall be far richer, that's Donald Trump. Now, does that make sense so people understand what what Colin's position was. Is that? So if we go back to, to this diagram, this is just lining these up, we can see here are the kings of Persia. Now, in the kings of Persia, we have lined them up with the kings. And in our line, the way that Jeff did it, Bush the first is number one. But when we dealt with these kings, we didn't continue on. That is, what we saw, we saw a change that was going to happen from Trump. We were going to jump to, to Greece. And, and so what was Jeff doing when he did that? What, what, what was he suggesting that meant? So if you're going to have these, uh, that Xerxes is going to be Trump, then who would the sixth be and who would the seventh be? Because Jeff doesn't address that specifically. Yeah, Jeff had uh, Alexander the Great representing Trump in the, uh, as head of the United Nations. Okay, right. So Jeff is going to take Xerxes and, and Colin's doing something similar, but different. <coughs> that is, um, Colin is saying that it's all the United States. 
But Jeff looked at it initially that uh, Trump is going to be end, end up running the UN because he's going to bring in the Sunday law like Xerxes does. And, um, and that he's going to be combined with the United Nations. So he's going to be the head of the United Nations. That was the idea, which I always rejected um, because I didn't think it was consistent. But we wouldn't have Artabanus and Artaxerxes here then. We would jump to, I mean, they exist there as kings. But as far as the line is concerned, we weren't looking for a sixth and a seventh president in that line, correct? No. And yet we were lining them up with the kings of Persia. So so why is it that we weren't looking for a sixth and a seventh? Does anybody have an answer to that? Because it's not there in, in uh, Daniel 11. So it's not in Daniel 11. But, but we did already line these things up with the presidents. That is, we looked at the 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 first seven kings of 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 Judah and we looked at the last seven kings of Judah we did the same with Israel then we looked at Persia but when it when it came to dealing with Daniel chapter 11 even though we had lined them up we just didn't continue because it moved to Greece and so we just said Trump's the last president it's going to move to Greece now if we move to Greece as the sixth, does that make sense? When we're dealing with logical progression. Okay, so when we had the seven heads and we had five or fallen, one is the sixth was who? United States. So United States, right? So, so now we're trying to compare the presidents of the United States with these kingdoms. Now, the position that Colin takes is that he just says, we're going to take Daniel chapter 11, the first few verses, and we're going to say it's all the United States. We're making an application that this is illustrating the United States. That we know Media Persia illustrates the United States. And, and so we're going to say that we're going to continue. But when we get to Greece, we're going to not say it's Greece, even though we accept the, the original interpretation that it's Alexander. We're just going to say that it's Trump. But in that, remember, he doesn't have a sixth or, or pardon me, he doesn't have the seventh. He just goes from Trump to Trump. That is in that passage there, you're going to have Xerxes, and then the next thing is going to be Xerxes again as the eighth, right, being Alexander. But he doesn't address the seventh because it doesn't deal with the seventh in his interpretation, his, his application. I just had a thought that um, would maybe support Collins' view. Mm -hmm. If we're lining up Trump with the United States being the sixth, mm -hmm. now we know that that's the, the one is, and we know that uh, we anticipated, well, the, the Millerites, we had the prediction in 1844 that Christ would come in that their time. So that would be saying, like, um, lining up with Trump, we thought he would be the one that brings in the Sunday law. Mm -hmm. But that didn't happen as mm -hmm. times goes on. So we have the seventh. But now I have, um, so I'm thinking we we'll have the so have Biden lines up then with the United Nations. And then with the eighth, that's Trump again. And so then we, we, we would be right in saying that. Yes, Trump is the one, the second coming then would line up. Yeah, and that's, that's the argument he's making. Now, the question is, though, 
So he's saying that Trump, now he's going to put Biden in there, right, in his structure, even though it's not mentioned in Daniel chapter 11. But if, if it's the globalists that took over, wouldn't that parallel the UN? Right. Yes. You, you understand what I mean? Yes. Greece. Greece is the globalist, the UN. And so yes. the eighth, in our understanding of, of it, who was always the eighth? The papacy. Is the papacy. And it wasn't about the same pope. We never said Pope Pius VI is going to be resurrected. Right? Mm hmm And... And now, now there was this discussion when he first presented it about which one is going to be the resurrected one because they had this view, well, it needs to be the fifth one and that's going to be Obama, right? So, so there was these inconsistencies in Colin's application that, that we didn't address. But I still think that Colin was essentially correct. I think the mistake was saying that it needs to be Trump. That if we can look at it as the one that is, because Trump isn't the one that's fallen. Right? Let's, let's look at it this way. Um, we have Trump here. In, in his line, it's the sixth. So it's the one that is. Because if we're interpreting the vision, the problem is the time frame. So if we're going to say five are fallen and one is, and one is yet to come, because that's how he's using this, and maybe I don't fully understand his argument. But what he's doing is he's going to 1798, which is the time of the end, and using our application. But if we're going to make an application, don't we have to say that five are fallen and that one is, and the one that is has to be the sixth, and that Trump would be the sixth. You understand what I'm what I'm asking about the time frame? That's what he is saying that Trump is the sixth. Yeah, he's saying Trump's the sixth. But in, in, in the original interpretation, the five that are fallen, it's the fifth one that becomes the eighth, right? Yes. Okay. But he says the sixth one's going to become the eighth. The one yes. that is doesn't receive a deadly wound. That is, if we, we make the parallel with Revelation 13 and Revelation 17, and we try to be consistent, uh, we, we have this problem. And this was pointed out. I believe by Daniel Fontenot and Bud, um, both pointed it out when he originally presented it, because that's what they saw as the problem right away. Like, there's five are fallen. The one that receives the deadly wound is the fifth one, and the one that is. Now, how could we take what Colin's doing and, and, and address that? Because if the one that's is and five are fallen, the one that is has to be the sixth, correct? Yes. So so if you're going to use the riddle, as he calls it, then Trump has to be the one that is. Now, how do we place Trump as the one that is? Where, where are we if we're placing Trump as the one that is? Don't we have to be at the time of the end? Well, that would fit. Okay. So but, when we uh, look at this, yeah, okay, go on, go on. You have some thoughts. Dude, dude, are you saying that the sixth one is the United States, right? And then, then but the seventh is the UN, then the eighth is modern Rome. Yeah, the papacy. Right. That, that's the way that the movement has always understood it. Right. right. So number six, so, so, Number six, if you put Trump there, then you put Biden, 
Okay. All right. Uh, all right. I'm you, see, you see the problem that he has. So he has to solve this problem somehow. And I've watched his videos and I haven't really seen him answer this clearly. You know, maybe he has an answer and he just hasn't, hasn't done it. But I think there is a solution. That is, if we have, if we're going to take this, um, I don't think we could use this line. That is, I don't think we can start with Reagan as number one. I think we have to put Reagan as the same with Darius the Mede. And then the five that are fallen, those would be Bush, Clinton, Bush the second, Obama, Trump. The one that is, is going to be at the time of the end. Right? Because, so get, get, think of these numbers here. So we'll just look at these numbers here. Five are fallen. One is, that's going to be the sixth. One is yet to come. That's the seventh. And then you're going to have an eighth. Now, so we have some things that we have to solve. So one is, we're going to take these as the heads as being the presidents of the United States. So let's even just examine that. Is there a basis for doing that? For doing all of them as is from the states? Okay, repeat that. Are, are you saying to make them all from the states? Well, no, not to make them all from the states. Well, I mean, they are the presidents of the United States. Um, in, in some way, they're going to represent presidents. But no, the question that I have is, is for them to represent, to take these kingdoms of the world that we have in Revelation 17, because we have it in an application or an interpretation that it's Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal. Rome, Papal is the fifth one. It's going to fall. The United States is the sixth head. And then the UN is the seventh head. That's always been our interpretation. But now we're going to take them and we're going to try to apply people, specifically the presidents of the United States. And we're going to start at a time of the end, just like we do with um, in 1798 and in 539 537 that is we're lining up these these times of the ends but now the time of the end that we have here is at the beginning of this line where the time of the end when we applied it to the kingdoms which i don't have here um i probably should have done that drawn that out but uh the kingdoms of this world babylon media persia greece rome pagan rome papal it's at the time of the end that the papacy receives the deadly wound. So can we place a time of the end here at the end of Trump? That is, is there a time of the end that occurs during Trump's reign is the question. Can we have another time of the end? Okay, what do we need for a time of the end to occur? Period of darkness. So we need a period of darkness. Okay, so you, so you need the wilderness. What else do you need? It's the time of the end, the end of what? I'm sorry. You need someone to be born, don't you? Same prophecy. You need a prophecy, right, that's going to end. Have we in any way lined up our message with the time of the end? Do we have a reform line within our movement that marks the time of the end? Do we have a prophecy? 
we begun to develop the reform line, but we don't have the we don't have the understanding of the prophecy yet. Okay. So if we were going to look back, it, I'm just saying, if I was going, this is me, if I was going to make the application that Colin's making, I would have to create a reform line that's going to have um, all of the elements of, of all the other applications of this riddle. That is, I wouldn't have the time at the end that we have in our line. I mean, that time of the end, I'm not doing away with, but I'm saying that we would have to have a fractal. We would have to look at this as a specific illustration within our reform line, that is the reform line of the priests, in order to have these presidents apply, because we, we can't just go back, at least in my view, we can't just go back to 1798 pull those um, kingdoms of the world, which we're marking 1798, five are fallen, and then come into our time and just say, well, we're gonna say five are fallen, these five, one is, that's Trump. One jet to come, that's gonna be something else. And then Trump's gonna come back again. You, you understand what I'm saying? That we we need a time at the end in order to say that five are fallen, one is. At least in my understanding of it. But don't we have that for this movement? We have some time prophecies that end in the time of Trump and that mark a time at the end for this movement. July 18th. Well, you got July 18th, and also we have November 9th, right? We have our, our structure of the 777 chiasm and, and that whole structure, plus, um, plus those different dates. We have a few different dates. But wouldn't we have to do that? Wouldn't, and if we did that, wouldn't we have to then take these presidents as as addressing a progressive destruction of four and a reform line following it with the time of the end and and wouldn't we then need um, wouldn't we then recognize that this is for this movement that that Trump is not about the world is about this movement. It's an illustration of what's going to happen, not what is happening. And, and don't we see this in the story of Esther? Most assuredly. Right. So shouldn't we understand, in this movement, shouldn't we understand that we have this, because the seven kings are addressing a, a, an illustration of the time of the end. And if we look at the story of Xerxes, we know that the story of Xerxes is going to be addressing the Sunday law. It's going to have July 18th attached to it, right? That is the 187 days. And, and we parallel Trump with Xerxes. And if we do that, we know that Xerxes is not the third angels arriving because the third message doesn't arrive until Artaxerxes. The 2300 days begins then. It doesn't begin in here. So this is an illustration of the first and second angels message, the first angels message being under Cyrus, the second Darius's decree. And Xerxes is a vent a movement that occurs within the second angel's message that illustrates the sunday law and shouldn't we expect the same thing in our movement so the only way that i can take these presidents as applying is if we apply them within our line itself that we can't put them on the big line we can't even put them on the line um with the, this being the time of the end, 
Reagan and Bush. We have to put a time at the end in our history. And then we can do this and we can see that it's an illustration. What's, and we've understood this, the pandemic is a type of the Sunday law, but it's not. And we can't expect the Sunday law under Trump. And so in my studies that I'm going to start tomorrow afternoon, so this is the end of this study, uh, but I'm going to start with the study on 2030, the Great Reset. And it's going to take some time to get through it. Um, but we will see that the goal or the the aim that that is being aimed at right now, the, the target that's being at by the papacy, by all the powers involved, is 2030. And 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 we know that there is that that all these things here are a precursor, a preparation. This COVID-19 um, pandemic is being utilized to bring about the goals that were seen by Klaus Schwab. And those goals are to be met in 2030. And we have three different powers vying for the control of the earth, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And so we can see those are being illustrated in our history, but they're not, they're not the prophecy that's being talked about on the bigger picture. And any thoughts of that before we close with prayer? Does that seem reasonable? I'd have to think about it a bit more. Yeah. I did notice that um, in, the, in the news there recently that the, the pandemic began in the United States on the 20th of January, 2020. Okay. So that was the, that would equate to the third year of Xerxes. We had lined right. up. So it was 180 days. That would be when the 180 day feast began. Mm -hmm. Right. So we already have that that understanding of of Trump and and his role, right, as Xerxes. And, and Xerxes is deceived, is he not? Yes. Okay. And that and that's why I've said, you know, we have to see Trump as Xerxes, and we have to see that what happens. With the Sunday law in the story of Xerxes is with Esther, the story of Esther. It was illustrating the pandemic. That is the Sunday law. But remember, it's not a Sunday law in the story of Esther. It's a type of the Sunday law. And it occurs under the second angel's message. Before Artaxerxes' decree occurs. And, and we illustrate it with July 18th. And that's also illustrated in Millerite history with Samuel Snow's letters. So, so these are some of the things that it's, it's a little deep. There's a lot of things connected. But we can see that if we were going to take this as a Sunday law is going to be coming with Trump being reelected, I don't think that we can see that. But we can see that even if Trump was reelected, it wouldn't be about Trump bringing in a Sunday law. It would be about the Battle of Paneum. Because we've had the Battle of Raphia, January 6, 2021. The King of the South conquered the King of the North. And then the King of the North has to win. And I don't think it has to be Trump. But even if it was Trump, it wouldn't be that Trump's going to bring in the Sunday law. I just don't see that it's that this and, and, and it's not about the next election for the president. It's about the midterm elections. It's just that the Republicans need to gain control. And we can see that this whole thing can be neatly tied up if we understand it correctly as an illustration of what is going to happen. But it's also connected to 2030. That is 
chronologically it's connected to 2030, but also when we look at the overall picture of all these different powers, it's all leading us to what's going to happen, not this year or next year, but still in the future. And that's what we're gonna we're gonna start addressing tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock Mountain Daylight Time. So any final comments on this? What about uh, that the Lord will come at the last trump? Would that okay. not imply be like a hint towards Trump being there at the end? Maybe well, the last blank. Trump is going to be after the close of probation, after the seven last plagues. And I don't know if you could, I mean, you can use Trump as a symbol of that, right? But I don't think you could take Trump literally having to be there at the last Trump. But But our history is illustrating that. Correct? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Trump, Trump is a type, and and the fact that he's a Trump, I mean, has two different meanings. Of course, it can mean deception, um, but it also can mean a trumpet. Mm -hmm. So, but we know that that's that's still just typical, because we wouldn't say at the last Trump, well, that's going to be Donald Trump, you know, in a, in a sort of literal sense. No, well, we know this is connected I, to the trumpets as well. I, I just think does that have like a wee hint, but I wouldn't put too much weight on it. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the things we see is we deal with the trumpets, and in the time of Trump, do we have the trumpets illustrating illustrating July 18, 2020? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so we have that symbol there already. But but Nashville didn't happen. On July 18th, and and this and, and in this line we should have known, because we can see that it's all typical. Our line was typical. So, so we're going to look at some of these things. Of course, Dwight has a, a study tomorrow at 7:30 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time, and then we have a study uh, in the afternoon at 2 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time, and then the Canadian group has their studies. Um, in the morning from 10 p.m. or 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time to whenever. So anyway, those are the things that are coming up. So there's going to be some interesting studies. And I wish we had more time to study. It'd be really nice to go through Daniel chapter 11. Maybe we're going to have to figure out a way to fit that in somewhere. But anyway, let's uh, close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath, for the blessings of fellowship and friendship, for the blessings of truth, for the rest that you give us spiritually and physically. And um, we are thankful, Lord, for each person who has continued to stretch their minds, to search for truth, to dig for buried treasure. We know, Lord, that there's still much here that we don't understand, and we just ask that you can continue to guide us in the study of these things. And um, we pray that we can be united upon the truth, that we can give the trumpet a certain sound, that we can give a message to the church and to the world that will draw all men unto you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um,